Hello, everyone. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, this is a kind of experimental event, uh, a panel discussion on the subject of minorities and philosophy. Uh, an important caveat um, is that, so though we're talking about the issue of minorities and philosophy, they shouldn't be seen as presenting a homogenous voice for what is clearly a very diverse experience. Rather, we should be clear in saying that we're just kind of presenting a few different views of a few different people who are minorities in philosophy within this department. So um, I'm going to, I guess I have to start by saying I'm not an expert in uh, this field, but even more so, I'm a woman and a pregnant woman, so you'll probably dismiss everything I have to say anyway, but you know, <laughs> I'm going to try and give it, give it a go. So the issue that I want to discuss with you today isn't about outright racism or homophobia or misogyny, but in some ways a much more insidious, pervasive, and perhaps even more difficult issue to deal with. It's something that's become known as uh, implicit bias. So here's a gloss on the definition of implicit bias. An implicit bias is a positive or negative. Uh, the ones that are going to concern us, I think, are more negative than positive, but still. A uh, mental attitude towards a person, thing, or group that a person holds unconsciously. Importantly, these biases are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control. And these kinds of beliefs or attitudes are supposed to be contrasted with explicit attitudes or beliefs. That is the kinds of things that if we were asked, we would, uh, we would avow, we would assert, we would assent to. Um, and so even those of us who are avowed egalitarians, uh, most of us will have these kinds of implicit <laughs> attitudes. What's really important about them is that we not only sort of um, harbor them, but they also affect our behaviors, our assumptions, our reactions, and our judgments. So as far as I'm concerned, there's two major questions that uh, we can look at. Uh, and the one that I'm going to look at is this first one. Is there a problem, right? So is there really a problem with implicit bias is one question. What can we do about it? I'm hoping that's going to be something that we have time at the end for discussion, right? I'm hoping that that's going to be something that we can come together and sort of brainstorm uh, some ideas on what it is that we can do about it. But uh, what I'm going to do is just present four different cases that are meant to give you a sense uh, that there is indeed a problem. So most of us, oh, and uh, to sort of reiterate the caveat, these are going to be cases about uh, women as minorities in particular. I apologize for the limited scope. I don't mean that to generalize uh, to uh, a position that only uh, women have a problem in philosophy as minorities. It's just the issue that I know a little bit more about than others. OK, so um, most of us are probably familiar with um, various sorts of explanations about why there aren't more women doing philosophy. So these explanations come in all different kinds of forms. One explanation is that women don't like how combative philosophy is or the aggressive nature of philosophy. Um, other sorts of explanations are that women don't like um, doing things with logic or argument. Um, <laughs> women, <laughs> you'll hear these things. Women tend to uh, prefer more caring or softer professions. My favorite um, is that women don't share the same intuitions as their male professors and when it comes to uh, thought experiments. And so they leave the discipline. Um, so there's all of these explanations that basically put the brunt of the burden of underrepresentation on the minority group, in this case, on women. 
Um, and the fact is that from a scientific perspective, it's actually really difficult to sort of tease apart whether it's the fault of the minority group or whether it's the fault of, say, the organizational structures in which that group is. Because after all, what are we going to do? Are we going to compare, say, an individual woman with an individual man? I mean, there's just so many variables that are going to end up in the mix that that's not really the way that we're going to approach it. We can't do good science there. Um, and that's why I think this is actually a really interesting approach. So um, the experience of transgender individuals, I think, here is really, it's novel, it's precious, and it's informative. So this is an article from the New Republic. It came out um, just this past summer. Why aren't women advancing at work? Ask a transgender person. So um, Ben Bars is a biologist at Stanford who lived and worked as Barbara Bars until he was in his 40s. For most of his career, he experienced bias, but didn't give it much weight, right? seeing incidents as discrete events. So for instance, solving a math problem and the professor saying, oh, you must have had your boyfriend solve it. But um, after Ben became Barbara, right? notice, sorry, when Barbara became Ben, however, he immediately noticed a difference in his everyday experience. He stopped being interrupted in meetings, at one conference, another scientist said, Ben gave a great seminar today, but then his work is so much better than his sister's. Um, the scientist didn't know that <laughs> the same person. Um, and what we see here is that this is actually typical for trans men. Right? So here's a book by um, Christian Schultz. Uh, where she interviewed dozens of female to male transgender individuals. Uh, one subject noted that when he expressed an opinion, everyone in a meeting now writes it down. <laughs> Another notice noted, when I was a woman, no matter how many facts I had, people were like, are you sure about that? It's strange not to have to defend your positions. Um, when they suggest women for promotions, other men said, oh, I haven't thought about her, so this is after the transition. They were able to promote women because their advice was now taken more seriously. Uh, personality traits that had once been viewed as negative uh, when they were women were now seen as positive. I love this. I used to be considered aggressive, said one subject. Now I'm considered take charge. People said, I love your take charge attitude. <laughs> of course, though, um, this is, in, in many ways, I mean, this is a case study, right? So these are the kinds of uh, studies, or this is the kind of methodology that people use in, let's say, anthropology or sociology, taken seriously. But of course, it's not sort of the gold standard of science, right? We don't have a control group. It's not double blind. Um, in some ways, it's not really quantifiable in the way that some people would uh, want their evidence to be. So let's look at another case. This is a case that is especially close to my heart, a case of student evaluations. So um, this is a study that was conducted not long ago, again, 2014, coming out of UNC. Here you have, uh, this is from the abstract. In our experiment, assistant instructors in an online class each operated under two different gender identities. Students rated the male identity significantly higher than the female identity, regardless of the instructor's actual gender, and obviously that's a gender bias. So what they did basically is that they had four discussion groups. All of this is online. You have four discussion groups. Uh, you have a man that takes two and a woman that takes two groups. In the first group, the man identifies as a man. In the second group, the man identifies as a woman. And the opposite goes for the woman. So what do you see? So if you actually compare performance, that is, if you, um, if you put all of the performance together, you don't have a, a significant difference. Uh, that's going to be the graph right here on your left. And in fact, the, I mean, it's not Statistically, statistically significant, but the woman does do just a little bit better. Um, 
what you do see is that you start to get a statistical significance in perceived maleness versus perceived femaleness. So students who thought they were being taught by women gave lower evaluation scores than students who thought they were being taught by men. It didn't matter who was actually teaching them. The instructor that students thought was a man received markedly higher ratings on professionalism, fairness, respectfulness, giving praise, enthusiasm, and promptness. There were 12 um, traits. All of them, the men did better, but significantly here. And this is quoting from the study. The difference in the promptness rating is a good example for discussion. Classwork was graded and returned to students at the same time by both instructors. But the instructor, uh, but the students, sorry, but the instructor students thought was male was given a 4.35 out of five. The instructor students thought was female got a 3.55 out of five. So just to draw your attention, that's more than a 15% difference in rating um, when we're talking about perceived femaleness as opposed to perceived maleness. The third case that I want to bring to your attention is one that maybe some of you are familiar with. This is the case of um, judging CVs um, and judging higher ability, uh, judging competence based on those CVs. So this is a 2012 study. Basically, very simply, what um, the, the paradigm was, was that you had a group of indiv individuals and they had to judge whether they should hire someone to be a lab manager. Um, they were given different CVs, but the only difference for certain groups was the name on the top of the CV. So here you have my CV, what we do, all we do is we change the name at the very top. Right. Amazingly, or perhaps not amazingly, what you see is just changing the name means that you have a significant difference in judgments of competence, higher ability, and mentoring. Again, this is um, somewhere between 15 and 20%, depending on which, uh, which category you're looking at. The last case that I'm gonna talk about, um, it was conducted in a business, or in a corporate setting about leadership and CEOs, but in some ways I think that this is probably the most relevant for, um, for us, given that it's about speaking in groups, given that we often are in seminar situations or in group discussions where we can decide whether or not to contribute. So I, um, I saw this study being uh, discussed in the New York Times. It was an article by Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant um, on wi why women stay quiet at work. So the article starts out, years ago while producing the hit TV series, The Shield, Glenn Mazzara noticed that two young female writers were quiet during story meetings. He pulled them aside and encouraged them to speak up more. Watch what happens when we do, they replied. Almost every time they started to speak, they were interrupted or shot down before finishing their pitch. When one had a good idea, a male writer would jump in and run with it before she could complete her thought. So um, the article then goes on to talk about the study. This is a study that was conducted out of Yale, um, analyzing whether, in fact, backlash and speaking up for women were uh, really things or whether it was just sort of perceived or paranoia. So suspecting that powerful women stayed quiet because they feared backlash, Professor Abrescal looked deeper. She asked professional men and women to evaluate the competence of chief executives who voiced their opinion more or less frequently. So this was done um, with vignettes. So they had a group of 
individuals that were reading vignettes about uh, potential CEOs or leaders of a group, and they were asked to evaluate those individuals based on those stories. Male executives who spoke more often than their peers were rewarded with 10% higher ratings of competence. When female executives spoke more than their peers, both men and women punished them with 14% lower rate. So now you have a 25% spread in speaking. These results suggest that high power women are in fact justified and they're concerned that they will experience backlash from being hot, highly voluble. A female CEO who talked disproportionately longer than others was rated as significantly less competent and less suitable for leadership than a male CEO who was reported as speaking the same amount. Um, I guess on this very depressing note, I'm going <laughs> to, to close, but I hope that what I've done is just suggested or um, helped you to see that this is a real problem, that it's a quantifiable problem, it's a problem that we, um, that we can approach with serious methodologies, but I really want you to, to think now and for the discussion about how it is that we can answer that second question, which is um, what can we do about it? Thanks. happy as Ellen is to be here <laughs> and it's great to have such an amazing turnout and thanks a lot for, to the Philosoph for organizing it. And I'm going to follow up uh, what Ellen has said, especially about the second question, what can we do? Okay. Um, a bit. <laughs> I don't want to steer Sorry the discussion depressing. in that direction, but I will talk about one proposal that has been made um, and give some thoughts on that. But first of all, um, I want to say something which is shameless advertising for a group I'm part of, and I'm very proud and happy to be a part of, which is the um, KCL MAP chapter. Um, a lot of you might already know what MAP is by now. Um, for those who don't know, I'll give you a quick run over what the idea of MAP is. Uh, of MAP, is. Um, MAP is um, an organization in the English-speaking area that aims at minorities and philosophy. Um, that's the overall aim. Um, and that's in, in quite a broad sense. Um, it is about um, minority issues in a profession from a theoretical as well as practical point of view. Um, and that organization encourages universities to form chapters um, that will address those issues and investigate those issues in their own departments. Um, we have an email address if anybody wants to get in touch with us, um, which doesn't help anonymity. So we came up with quite an old fashioned scheme to make sure that students can hand in things anonymously. Um, so we have an envelope where you can put written notes for us into which is, uh, and I hope it's still there next to uh, Maria Rose's office. Um, what I want to talk about is um, quite specific. It's about diversifying syllabi. So Ellen has already pointed out quite clearly what the problem is. The problem is that we seem to have implicit biases. And unfortunately, if you look at the studies, probably all of us. Um, there are also tests you can do online if you're interested in it. Um, I think Harvard has a project on implicit biases. Um, they have tests there. Um, don't be too harsh on yourself when you see the outcome. Um, which also means this, it is a bit of a tricky issue because it sounds very, very, very objectionable to have biases. Um, and in some sense, that's true. In that case, there are implicit biases, and it's first and foremost um, about pointing out and making people aware of the fact that there exist those biases, also in our profession. Um, also, especially because I think philosophers like to think about themselves as being better than that. I also would like to think about ourselves as have been more objective than others. Um, if you trust the experiments, um, people who think about them as being more objective than others tend to be more biased than others. Um, and there are a couple of proposals that have been made by uh, people working in the profession and working on those issues. Um, and there's quite a wide range. Um, one of the most straightforward ones is um, and that's intuitive, is anonymization as far as possible. 
if you don't know who that person is and which group it might fall into, you are probably less likely to be biased because you have less grounds to be biased on. So the idea is, if you have the option to anonymize something, do it. Um, and there's another solution that has been made, which is to diversify syllabi. And when I heard it, I thought, that's a great idea. That's so straightforward. Um, and then I start thinking about it. And I have to put in a disclaimer as well. I will talk mainly about women and female philosophers. Uh, also for the reason um, for what I talk about, um, they're easier to identify as being a neglected group. Um, because I'll talk about people whom you probably have never met and might never meet. Um, and diversifying syllabi sounds very simple, and sometimes people are a bit worried about that, but I'll come to that in a second. Um, and why, the reason why people think that um, undiversified syllabi are a problem is because they think um, it kind of strengthens and keeps going um, certain implicit biases we have. Um, one of them is if you have a syllabus and all the authors or the majority of the authors are on the syllabus are male. Um, you might give the idea um, that good philosophy is done by men. If the first people you think about when you hear about the specific topics are men, then probably you will have intuitively this suspicion that maybe men do better work in philosophy. There is a second worry that aims more at the groups that are biased against, and that's um, the worry that if you only have um, syllabi dominated by male, which usually also goes in accordance with departments where there are far more men that are members of staff than women. Um, you can look up the numbers that's true, I assume, about most departments in this country, if not all. Um, that there is the worry that there is a lack of a role model, which seems true as well and intuitively right. Is if you work in an area and um, you are a woman and there's nobody else that you read and people think is important um, that is of your gender, you might get the suspicion that maybe that's not the place you should be. Um, so the solution is quite straightforward, is diversify the syllabi and reflect those worries and try to solve those, wor those worries. And what uh, a group has done is put on a web page a list of readings you might suggest. Um, and I looked at it, and I do history of philosophy, I do early modern philosophy, so that's what I looked at. Um, and then I found out when I looked at it that there is something that intuitively strikes me as a bit odd. Um, because the majority of the reading on those lists were women who lived at that time and had correspondences with philosophers we all do read. Um, and, what's, and the worry that people have is because some people put forward ideas like that is um, if you diversify a syllabi f syllabus, for example, in history, what you do is you bring people in that weren't major players that might have influenced our philosophical thought less than, let's say, Descartes, for example, on whom I think we can agree had quite an influence. Um, and people are worried that that would mean um, that there is a decrease in quality. Um, because you don't focus on what is going to be essential for the pro um, profession you are in, um, but you rather look at something based solely on the reason that it was written by a woman. Um, so the question is, is that the only way diversification of a syllabus can look like? Um, and I would say no, and I think there are more considerations and it's more difficult um, than just saying, look, there are women out there, just put them on there. Um, so what's proposed usually is when you do early modern philosophies, put on um, Princess Elizabeth, who was in the letter exchange with Descartes. Um, that's a really interesting read, once you know Descartes. Because what she's doing is, she tries to point out to Descartes where the problems in his system are. Um, so if you think about a department like ours, where you have 10 weeks of teaching, um, you need, you have a focused syllabus. You need to make sure that what people learn is what they need to know in order for us to say, now we can send them out into the world of philosophy and they hopefully have not too many encounters 
where there's something they should have really, really learned or heard about and they haven't. Um, but especially in the history of philosophy, it strikes me as odd to suggest that what you should put on as primary reading are women, which is helpful if you have the space and if you have a focus in the syllabus where they fit. But there are so many women who did absolutely <coughs> brilliant work in the secondary literature. And that's what sometimes gets a bit overlooked when people talk about diversifying syllabi, is um, as a role model, people who live in your own time, who have places in departments and who do excellent work, are those people you should put forward as role models. Um, so the worry in general would be that if you diversify syllabi, you have a decrease in quality. That's a worry that people have. Um, so what you have to do is, if you promote the diversification of syllabi, you have to ensure that quality stays the, stays the same. Um, that is, there is one problem, is there seem to be some areas in philosophy where this is far more difficult than others. It's few of them. But there might be some where you say, well, if I teach undergraduates that module, I might struggle with putting um, papers or articles or books written by women on the syllabus. There might be some of them. I'm, I dare to say them, for the majority, that's not true. Um, it might take a bit of work for the person running the module to have to take the time and have the second thought and say, these are the people I come automatically up with. I check them, I look at them, and I might need to say, well, they're all men, let's make the extra effort and think about the people that don't cross my mind immediately but should have crossed my mind. Um, and that way would be an easy way to ensure that there shouldn't be a worry about quality. And I'm also there to say, um, if you have a syllabus and you have your focus, and your focus dictates that the only papers you can put on there are written by men, and there is no equally good contribution by women, you might need to think about the focus of your course. Um, because that, that should be a sign that should give you something to worry about. Um, at least you should have a second thought and think, maybe I went wrong somewhere there, and maybe I'm, apart from not putting forward role models, maybe also topic-wise I promote something um, that is based on implicit biases in the first place. Um, so I think the reasoning should be quite clear. There shouldn't be a decrease in quality. Um, so you should do it. But um, also so I can talk about somebody who is that for quite a while because that's my field of expertise. Um, let's play, even if you think, well, yeah, we could do that, but why should we really, um, it, does it really matter? Let's play a variant of Pascal's wager. Um, so the idea is if you put it on the syllabus and it doesn't help, but it doesn't lead to a decrease in quality, no harm done. Um, if you do it and it has the effect you want it to have, that's excellent news because you do something about implicit biases in your own profession. Uh, pro profession. Um, if you don't do it and it wouldn't have done any harm or any, wouldn't have had any positive effects in the first place, then you were accidentally right and that's good for you, but there is really no immediate win from that. Um, but if you do it, if you don't do it and it would have had the effect, then I think some people might have the suspicion that you've done something uh, that is wrong. Um, so I don't, and I think that reasoning goes for a lot of those immediate means that um, are easily justified in philosophy, where people should think it's not extraordinarily much work, it's easily done, it might not have the effect we hope it to have, though we we might be also justified in assuming that it possibly has. There are good reasons to think that. But even if you deny that, um, if you don't do it, the risks are far greater than if you do it. And that it itself, even if you think that it doesn't help, should give you a motivation to do it. I just try to end on a more positive note, I think, but I'm not sure if that's even more positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.
politics, philosophy, and law. Uh, I love philosophy the most, but don't tell the others that. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to talk about things that I think about a lot. Um, so race, gender, processes of empire, and like what that might mean for um, philosophical and intellectual inquiry. Um, so um, I think I want to try bring this back to theory. Uh, I talk about my experiences a lot. I talk about activism a lot. It's kind of part of what being a feminist is. People are constantly asking you about your experiences. But I want to talk a bit more about theory, um, to kind of like wheel this back to why um, I love philosophy in the first place. Um, so I want to talk about, I want to give a manifesto for what it might mean to be a minority in a philosophical department, specifically a minority like me, who's an immigrant, um, and you know, who's a person of color and a woman. You know, so I'm, I'm really interested in seeing those things and how they might interplay to look at theory and look at the th kinds of interesting things that we can do with theory. Um, so I'm probably going to be a bit heretical. I'm going to invoke philosophers that you don't think are philosophers. And I think it's important to talk about that. I think it's important to talk about why post-colonial theorists, for instance, aren't considered to be doing real philosophy. Um, um, and I want to give, give us some agency back. Um, I think it's time we talked about how to make theory more diverse, have more dialects within, within theory as opposed to just, you know, let's put more women in the department, you know, let's put more immigrants in the department and have more immigrants become philosophers and that's gonna create social change. What I love about philosophy is that I think it is, philosophy is about action. It's about us doing things to radically transform the world around us. Um, and yeah, and that's why I love philosophy. Um, so yeah, um, and also yeah, apologies that we're running late, that's because of me. I just had a class for an hour on product liability. Uh, and <laughs> I, I love philosophy because it gets me to think about product liability in interesting ways. So, um, yeah, and so doing this talk in the setting of the philosophy department um, really takes me back to my first year at university because it was in a philosophy seminar room that I realized that most British and European students um, who are predominantly white in this department um, had barely the slightest clue about imperialism or colonization. And a great part of that part of British history was rather conspicuously absent from their school curricula. Um, when I had this realization, I called my best friend back in India and, uh, to share this outrage that we'd spent 12 years in the school system studying about what the British did to us and British people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, it was shocking. We were really upset. So, but you know, these histories of empire, of conquest, of subjugation, they have interesting and really wide-ranging ramifications for the work that we do as philosophers today um, in the classroom and of what philosophers we choose to include in the syllabus um, and what we consider as pertinent when we assess their work. Um, so my favorite example of this is John Stuart Mill. Um, who I've read several times at university on two different political philosophy classes. Gary taught me one of them. <laughs> and, uh, um, and on an ethics class, um, on, and in, uh, but on utilitarianism. Um, so Mill is, you know, this classic liberal philosopher, um, and you know, the fact that his day job included a key role in the East India Company's affairs is often relegated to an aside in the lecture. Um, and it seems ad hominem to most to even consider the possibility that 35 years working in the India office may have had something to do with his work on political liberty, um, sub uh, subjection, and British imperialism. Um, fortunately, there's been a growing body of literature on this. There's an excellent book in the morning about this that I highly recommend reading. But you know, it's, it's pe people think it's ad hominem to even talk about this. But the important point that I want to make is that Mill, who is this classic liberal philosopher that's given us these objective moral principles about organizing political life, it adopted this very openly racist doctrine that civilizations can be judged on this evolutionary scale. So some civilizations are advanced um, and others are primitive, or as you would call them today, underdeveloped. Um, or low-income countries. Uh, so Mill was also a proponent of free trade, um, and he opposed monopolies in his understanding of liberty, and yet he defended a trading company which forcefully had to be divested of its monopolistic powers in 1857. Um, he's remembered as a philosopher of liberty, um, but you know he used this primitive evaluative scale to judge civilizations. He's known for his advocacy of parliamentary democracy, and it is still certain that he was willing to countenance despotism when he thought that it was in the interest of the evolutionary scale of progress, that is, utilitarianism. So it was in the Indian people's, people's best interests that they were subjugated by the empire. Um, you know, it's up for us then to think of Mill and evaluate how much of this legacy we've retained in modern liberalism. Um, and that's why I think it's important to historicize our understanding of philosophy. Because um, I suspect that we would all agree that this version of problematic liberalism cannot just be attributed to him being a man of his times. 
um, it's well and alive today. Uh, the tendency for free trade proponents to have to defend entire sectors largely controlled by a few large global corporations. The tendency for parliamentary democracy to defend despotism when deemed in the national interest, or as we call it now, national security. For liberals to assume that Western or European democracy is a pinnacle of civilization. Uh, so when Francis Fukuyama said that we were at the end of history, uh, you know, there were certainly many people in my classrooms listening. Um, so an interesting offshoot of post-colonial theory and histori historiography has been in the work of Partha Chatterjee, who is, uh, is a, he, he does history, he doesn't do philosophy, but I'll try and make him relevant. Um, and he does, uh, he has this interesting book out that's called uh, The Politics of the Governed, and he applies the Foucauldian concept of governmentality, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and applies them to the colonies. And he argues that the, the tendencies of centralizing government that are witnessed in the West today, so state responses to strikes, what's deemed as a riot, which populations are deemed capable of rioting and looting, public surveillance, so these were actually tendencies that were tested in the crucible of the colonies, um, tested and perfected there before being applied to the capitalist states in crisis in the West today. Um, I think we see these links now more than ever. We see how the state machinery that's as being police departments in the USA are machinery left over from departments, um, buying them in a rush to fight global war on terror, uh, how this machinery is often Israeli made, used on Palestinian people, bought by the Indian government, used on Kashmiri people. Um, and I insist that this is of philosophical importance. These are techniques of repression seemingly at odds with liberty, and yet I've de demonstrated that the Western rhetoric of liberty always implied a justification of imperialism, and these techniques of government can be shown to trace back to colonial history. So what's made apparent from the one example of John Stuart Mill is that Western values, and like, specifically European values, are considered universal. Um, and there's a long history of this universalizing process following, and following post-colonial theory, I think it would be appropriate to call this a hegemony, right? So it's a cultural hegemony that we live in, and it's inseparable from the way that those of us that live in the Orient see ourselves and we live. We are discursively positioned, manipulated, and our practices, modes, and languages of being and thinking and seeing are constantly orbiting as satellites around Western hegemony. Um, and this is why I'm gonna even invoke Edward Said as a philosopher, and I hope you have some questions that you know will challenge me on this, because um, I really think that it's important to bring Edward Said and Partha Chatterjee and DPS Chakrabarty into this room here with us. Um, I did a debate last term with uh, Alex and Jay, actually, and um, the question was on whether the existence of God was of moral relevance. So, and we did actually win the debate, uh, <laughs> but I distinctly remember our opposition trying to argue, um, you know, as you do, that there are, there are objective moral principles. Um, and we, there are objective moral uh, principles because FGM is bad, right? Um, of course we would invoke female genital mutilation and the cutting of young girls, and I really want us not to hide from this, because as philosophers we are implicated in the choices that we make in our rhetoric and the sorts of things that we denounce. It's much easier to denounce FGM as an objective moral horror as it is something committed by a race that we deem to be barbaric or evil or by specifically barbaric and evil men onto helpless, tradition-bound, meek women in lands that have not yet seen the light of European values and civilization, despite almost a century of missionaries. <laughs> so are these not the implicit assumptions that we make when we choose FGM as our subject rather than slavery or the wanton shooting of young black people on the street by the police? FGM to the white philosopher is easy to condemn. It fits within the precise colonial logic within which moral principles of liberty, equality, and freedom were formulated. It does not require internal criticism. And this is why it's important for philosophers and intellectuals to consider history, to consider disciplines outside of philosophy contributing to the rhetoric of philosophical work, how philosophy can be profoundly alienating if you're from a if you're a minority, and how philosophical principles formulated in within this discourse are applied in other areas and legitimated in those other areas. So I'm concerned with the law. Um, I primarily see myself as a legal theorist in many ways. So I'm interested in how we choose to use FGM in a debate like that, and then that influences the way in which people are legislating on FGM. So there's like this transposing of uh, philosophy and then applied philosophy in the law. Um, so Deepesh Chakrabarti called upon us to provincialize Europe, to take these enlightenment ideas that have now become universal, so this universal idea of equality, reason, rationality, liberty, freedom, and provincialize them to the specific European um, enlightenment context in which they emerge. So the discursive position of rights, duties, and freedoms from which the political philosopher and the lawyer continually bargain with come from a very specific Western enlightenment context, and they're yet considered to be universal. 
So a really good example of this um, is the Rawlsian Veil of Ignorance, um, where the morality of an issue is determined by putting some people at a table behind a veil that separates them from the rest of the society uh, and saying, okay, you know, you know nothing about your position in society. You don't know your race, you don't know your gender, you don't know your class, you don't know your preferences, your tastes, abilities, and you're going to pick the principles by which you live on the outside. So the idea is that we would pick to live in a roughly egalitarian society because anyone at the table once the veil is lifted could be a woman in a picture of the society, a disabled person in an ableist society, a slave in a society based on slavery. Um, and this kind of thought experiment, though, merely just reaffirms um, and reuniversalizes principles that are already universal to our society. It takes for granted this implication that all societies want to codify the, way, the principles by which they live, that we would want to abstract equality, right, duty into these kinds of formalistic practices. That's not something that's universal to civilization, <coughs> but that's Wall's starting premise. So this is a much more radical critique than the ones that we had to read from philosophy with um, Susan Waller <laughs> 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 um, Right, so, um, and even with things like redistributive principles, um, how would they play out for indigenous communities in settled colonial states? So I propose that we engage in a process in philosophy where we historicize it and we place it within this context of imperialism and colonialism. Because these ideas of rights that we talk about in political philosophy, they were never really very absolute. They were never practiced in the colonies in full. Um, so how do these rights still not operate in the mother country? right? So how do you still fail to be liberal within your own country? So drawing on Marx, but even thinkers after Marx, how are liberal values still systematically betrayed for minorities under capitalism? How are these rights operationalized? What do they shield? I'm asking that we engage in a process of making philosophy instrumental and applying it to the world around us. And in the world around us, we see that empire not only survives, but it thrives. When we think of empire in terms of economic and cultural dependencies, we still have to analyze the hegemony of empire and the legacy of this universalism of morals. So my main area of inquiry is what that's done to legal systems. We have now what Derrida calls like a global Latinization. So not just a globalization of legal systems, but a globalization of legal systems that are founded on a very specific Judeo-Christian heritage. So it's a global Latinization of um, legal forms that are constitutionalized, formalized, codified according to Enlightenment age, philosophical values, and religious traditions. So to provincialize Europe, is to understand our legal constitutions as positioned in relation to Judeo-Christian values, to have inherited this legacy. When state leaders in India make statements, when they ask for forgiveness, they are partaking in this religious legacy. So then to provincialize Europe is to understand that these philosophical values that seem to us objective, that seem self-evident and self-affirming, arise from a very specific context. To provincialize Europe, then, is to understand modernity as a dialect and to allow room for other dialects that affirm principles of value in their own ways in line with their own traditions. To provincialize Europe and the canon of Western political philosophy is then to create room for minorities in philosophy to flower. To do this despite the universalizing tendency of global circulations of capital is a problem, but that's a whole other lecture. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm going to start largely um, like Shruti from a more kind of theoretical perspective. Um, and also, again, from this point that philosophy can be extremely alienating um, for lots of minority groups. And, and specifically, um, I'm looking at how uh, philosophy can be alienating for queer people. Um, and in doing this, um, I'd like to introduce a thesis that will kind of perhaps you know, go throughout kind of what I talk about, which is that we need to include um, the queer experience, and it's necessary to include it in the pursuit of doing good philosophy. Um, and I want to say that this isn't limited just to doing things like ethics and political philosophy, um, which can be perhaps the kind of normal way of characterizing it, but that actually um, including the exper uh, queer experience can also be important for things like metaphysics and more theoretical areas of doing philosophy. Um, but out of this thesis, there seem to become two questions that come out of it. Um, I mean, the question of, you know, what is the queer experience? What is it, what is it we're talking about when we're talking about um, queer people doing philosophy and, and even just queer people existing in the world? And second of all, what is it that we're talking about when we're talking about philosophy? What is it that actually we're engaging in? Um, it seems in some sense as, as if, if we include the queer experience in our thesis that one question seems to in some sense answer the other. 
um, if we're talking about the queer experience, and it seems if we're going to end up precluding certain facets of what I'm very broadly and in scare quotes going to call analytic philosophy. Um, namely, um, it seems that if there's going to be some kind of problem for things like traditional empiricism or naturalism or whatever you want to call it. Um, more specifically, you know, the certain view that wants to clarify objective views about the world um, and wants to neutralise epistemic orientation such that we're detached from... Um, some kind of from our situatedness in the world um, this kind of view that says it doesn't matter whether you're queer or straight or what class background you're from what race you are, what gender you are it's just that you as a human have some kind of experience of the world, you have the same access so therefore we can you know, claim some kind of degree of objectivity essentially what I want to say from um, the queer experience is that first of all that strict objectivity is overrated um, and second of all, there is an implicit heteronormativity, if not a whole host of other assumptions, in this notion of objectivity. Um, and it seems that there are kind of two ways we can critique this. Um, first of all, a phenomenological critique, um, which I'm going to take largely from Heidegger, and a genealogical critique from Foucault, and some of the ideas Shruti has already kind of gestured towards. Um, so the phenomenological critique runs largely from what Heidegger thinks, uh, in one sense, philosophy should be doing. Um, which is to make explicit the implicit practices that constrain our understanding of what exists. Um, there's quite a lot in that. Um, so if, 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 we kind of, if we start with kind of understanding, so Heidegger has a relatively original set, idea of what we think of when we understand. So Heidegger doesn't think that understanding is just some way that we come to know the world. Uh, in some sense, Heidegger wants to say that um, understanding is the way that we are within the world. Um, and, this is, and he essentially comes to this notion because of where he thinks understanding comes from or where our own understanding comes from, uh, which is our situation in the world. Um, and he takes a situation to mean things that are determined by our cultural, social, historical aspects, um, what he calls historicality. Um, and it's through our historicality that we determine what is real. Um, so essentially for Heidegger, this notion of understanding and this notion of what we are in the world um, is subject to some kind of interpretation. Um, and essentially our, encountering, our encountering the world um, involves some kind of interpretation based on historicality. Um, and further, because these things that come to create our own historicalities are defining of us, we therefore can't eliminate them. Um, and this seems to gesture towards things like implicit biases and whatever as well. Um, and this also seems to go back to what he thinks we should be doing when we do philosophy. So he says that because we can't eliminate our historicality, we need to be aware of and account for these interpretative influences. Um, and furthermore, because these things are defining of us, the rule has a differing relation to each perceiving entity. In some sense, it's relatively intuitive. Um, so if you think of things, we have the kind of same content but a different response. Um, so an English speaker who only speaks English reading a French speaker versus a French speaker speaker reading a French newspaper. The same thing is there, but the way they respond to um, the phenomenal information is different. Um, and in, a, in philosophical terms, this is kind of what um, Heidegger's kind of infamous hermeneutic circle gets at. Um, in phenomenology, it's this moving from parts of experience to the whole of experience. Um, but equally, we need to, we need to um, analyse hermeneutically historical philosophical texts um, we need to not only account for our own historicality, but the historicality of the philosophers that we're working with in order to sufficiently engage with and understand the text that we're working with. Um, so, it seems that we so it seems like, you know, um, there's both an analysis of, you know, how we're understanding the world that we're confronted with and also what we're doing with philosophy. It seems like in both of these cases, purely in virtue of historicality, that... Um, this notion of objectivity is already kind of in question. It seems like it becomes more profound when we consider the kind of specificities of the queer experience. Um, it seems to be able to do that, we need to kind of actually get to grips with what we're talking about when we say queer, or what we mean by queerness. Um, I think it's really unhelpful in this situation to provide a list um, which kind of often seems to be the case, because invariably what ends up happening is you... Is, um, you end up missing somebody out or you don't account for whatever. But it, but, it, but it seems like there's some notion of queerness that we can work from. And what does seem undeniable about queerness is that first of all, it's a facet of historicality. Um, and in virtue of this fact, it then becomes a mode of understanding for us. Um, one of the best ways of kind of showing this um, in terms of gender is when Simone de Beauvoir kind of famously talks about one is not born a woman, but rather one becomes one. One can e e easily replace woman with queer in that situation, um, alongside a whole other host of minority groups. Um, it's not that, you know, this is some kind of objective fact about you, but it does become defining of you, and furthermore, it becomes defining of how you perceive the world. Um, 
and 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 we consider and we can consider this kind of phenomenology in a queer sense. Um, so Sarah Ahmed in her book Queer Phenomenology, phenomenology which is really fab, and everyone should go and, out and buy. Um, <laughs> She used, she used the example of, of queer people versus heterosexual people um, in the family home. Uh, so there's, no, there's this notion in phenomenology about orientation, which initially comes from Kant, and Kant, somewhere or other, um, talks about, um, he uses this thought experiment of you being blindfolded in a room and how can you find your way? And there are certain things that you kind of need in a situation to be able to do that, such as knowing left from right, left from right and whatever. Um, how do you get things to something more than that? I mean, orientation isn't just about knowing where you are, but when you're situated in a certain space, um, it's this matter of, well, how do you... How, um, how do you it's, it's not just this situatedness, but it's how do you feel at home. Um, and when Sir Ahmed is talking about the family home, it's, it, the... The, the family home for heterosexual people is, is orientating. It has, it has, you know, all this intimacy towards your parents. It's probably where um, most of your morals have come from. Um, but by contrast, this can become ex extremely disorientating for queer people, purely because it's tied up in this notion of heterosexual intimacy. Um, and there's this kind of untranslatability in terms of that actually we're just perceiving different things. Um, when we come back to the family home. So the kind of fundamental premise that I want to get across here is, is this notion that um, when you have differing situations, you have a differing reality. Um, and this seems to have kind of both political and metaphysical consequence. Um, and one way of looking at this is um, this idea of realness, um, or what we take to be ontological commitment um, in terms of gender. Because in some sense, kind of obviously, when we talk about gender, it, it's, it's not real. It's something we project onto ourselves or we project onto other people. Um, you know, if we take ourselves to, you know, not be defined by these things um, that we, you know, usually identify each other with, then sure, we just heap of matter. But that's really just not a helpful way of talking about people in the world. Um, and there's this other sense where things like gender and sexuality, um, race, whatever, are, you know, defining... of First of all, how we see the world and how we're treated in the world. And this is why it's both political and metaphysical. Um, it's, you know, I mean, we can talk about things like justice or whatever in a kind of political sense, although I kind of want to put that to one side. Um, but kind of metaphysically, um, when we have these kind of differing situations, different realities based on our historicality, um, we have to reconsider how we construe things like ontological commitment and whatever. Um, so the ph phenomenological critique... Um, is essentially that we see the world based on historicality, and this is something we can't escape. Therefore, we need to include historicality in philosophical practice. And then furthermore, that queerness is a component of historicality. Um, therefore, queerness is an essential component of doing philosophy well. Um, the question we then seem to come to is kind of, well, why isn't it? Why is it, this, um, why is it so ignored in how we do philosophy, especially in the UK and America? Um, and it seems that like these notions of orientation and historicality lead us um, to genealogy, um, which is kind of you know, Foucault's main method of doing philosophy, this, telling this subversive historical story of you know, how these philosophical concepts we have um, come from these origins, which perhaps aren't probably where they should be coming from. Um, so he kind, of, he kind of looks at the genealogies that were done um, 80, 90 years before him by Nietzsche, um, and Nietzsche kind of shows the, these, these, these notions of, of, of goodness and justice and all these moral concepts that we use um, come out of historical accidents or they come out of errors, but they almost become dogma to how we do philosophy. Um, and when Nietzsche talks about genealogy, he wants to look, look at the psychology of the people that are doing philosophy. Um, so Nietzsche kind of wants to go, well, what sort of person is, is actually going to think that you know, coming up with an a priori moral theory is a good idea? Um, that's not so much what Foucault's doing. I mean, Foucault's quite sceptical towards psychology anyway. Um, and he wants to look more at things like um, power relations. Um, and obviously, Foucault has this very um, distinctive view of power um, where it's not held by any one person. It's, it's this circulating set of norms, um, which we then instantiate, and through our instantiation of them, then become constitutive of us. Um, and, ex and, you know, extremely closely tied to power is this notion of knowledge um, and how social norms influence discourse. Um, he thinks the way that we speak about things in an academic context um, is essentially determined by these power relations and the kind of 
um, paradigm example that is always used and which I'm going to use is um, the one in the history of sexuality um, where towards the end of the 19th century we stop talking about the sodomite and we start talking about the homosexual and essentially what's going on there is that although we're talking about the same situation we move from this theological moral way of speaking about certain acts into a psychiatric biological way of speaking about it it stops being this moral evil it starts becoming this neurosis that we can somehow treat um, but the thing that we should be kind of be taking from this is that the way that we're talking about things um, in philosophy, as well as any other um, means of inquiry, is extremely dependent on the, in, on the society that we're um, operating within. So it seems like in virtue of all of this, that it's relatively uncontroversial to say that we practice philosophy in heteronormative times. And as such, philosophy has a heteronormative orientation. Um, and this seems to have um, direct consequences for things like objectivity. I mean, objectivity is usually justified on some kind of notion of, of a kind of shared access. So scientists test something enough times, they see this happen, therefore this is the objective way of seeing things. Um, but this conjunction of historical, historicality and power knowledge seems to imply that this isn't objectivity. Um, it may be that there's some kind of world out there that we're all... Um, accessing, and that doesn't seem to be controversial, but the way that we're talking about it when we're claiming objectivity is this notion of heterosexual subjectivity. Um, so, um, queer voices are ever in philosophy, and it seems like we deserve to be heard purely in virtue of the fact that we exist and we have some kind of historicality. The problem, obviously, is that we aren't heard, along with a whole host of other minority groups. This seems to be in virtue of the, histor of the philosophical story and also kind of other practical considerations. So something that I would like to bring up in terms of trans people is, is, is the problem of transitioning when you're already um, working in academia. Um, so it isn't necessarily a problem when you, have, um, when you send off journal articles, because obviously they're blindly reviewed and whatever. Um, when you have your CV, if you've published X, Y, and Z under your birth name as opposed to your real name, um, then either you have to out yourself on your CV, um, which you don't necessarily want to do if you're working in certain parts of the world, even here, um, or you just don't include them on your CV, and then you have a worse CV. Um, so, um, so, I mean, there seems to be problems in both the way that we're doing philosophy and actually the way that people are able to access philosophy. Um, so it seems like there seem to be two tactics which very vaguely and broadly I think we need to pursue. Um, first of all, practicing philosophy in a way that it's more inclusive. Um, and second of all, breaking down academic barriers to be able to open up spaces for queer and other minority voices. Thank you.